Yeah, I remember, um, I don't know if you've ever had this thought. Um, most of you are probably more sanctified than me. But um, <clears throat> I remember um, very early on in my walk with Jesus that, um, <clears throat> you know, we talk about, like, you know, forever we're going to praise his name. Forever we will worship him. Gathered around the throne, forever singing his praises. And look, I'm going to be honest, I thought, well, you know, I mean, that's, that's good for a bit. But at some point, I imagine I'm probably going to get bored. You guys would never think that because you're more sanctified than me, much more holy than me. But I'm just like, like, that's it. Like, I love, I love worship for somewhere between 20 and 45 minutes on average. And then I'm, I, my flesh starts kicking in, right? But I remember I had this one experience where um, I, was, I was washing the dishes um, one night at, at the church I was at. And, and the Holy Spirit just jumped me with his presence. And, um, and I found myself face down, just crying out, holy, 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 holy. And, um, and I got this revelation in that moment. It's like I understood something that you could never really understand unless you had experienced it before. Is that I genuinely felt like in that moment that I could do that forever. And genuinely never get bored of it. And it is so beautiful when the saints gather and they worship and we have these, these crescending moments where we're singing, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is His name, worthy is the one who was slain, has been raised from the dead, who has all authority and power in heaven and on earth. And I just want to encourage you that one day, one day there will be a place, there will be a time when our flesh will no longer fail us. And we'll be free to worship him forever, without hindrance, without encumberment. And I just want to encourage you with that this morning. Um, because he's good. He is good. And um, it's his goodness that leads us to repentance. It's his kindness and his grace. If you've got your Bibles there, I'll get you to open up to Galatians chapter 3. We're going to be continuing in our series here uh, this morning. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 3, and we're going to be going, uh, we're going to be doing eight verses this morning, um, <clears throat> some more thoroughly than others, um, but I'm going to read that here with us, and then we're going to proceed to jump into the text. So Galatians chapter 3, if you don't have your Bibles with you, it will be up here on the screen uh, behind me. It says this, it says, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, because it is written... Everyone who does not do everything written in the book of the law is cursed. Now it is clear that no one is justified before God by the law because the law, uh, because the law, uh, because the righteous will live by faith. But the law is not based on faith. Instead, the one who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Because it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. The purpose was that the blessing of Abraham would come to the Gentiles by Christ Jesus so that we could receive the promised spirit through faith. Brothers and sisters, I am using a human illustration. No one sets aside or makes additions to a validated human will. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as though referring to many, but referring to one, and to your seed, who is Christ. <clears throat> My point is this, the law, which came 430 years later, does not invalidate a covenant previously established by God and thus cancel the promise, for if the inheritance is based on the law, it is no longer based on the promise, but God has graciously given to Abraham through the promise. Now, Paul has just made it marvelously clear for all of us exactly what he means by all that verbiage. Amen? There's really no need to preach at this point because everything, you, you all understand inheritance law in the ancient world and you all understand, you know, everything that Paul is saying here. No, Paul, Paul gets very wordy 
and he's saying a lot of different things in here. We're going to attempt to unpack the essence of what he's actually going after in his argument here in the letter to the Galatians. So before we jump into that, though, we just need to do a quick recap because it's been a month since we've been in the book of Galatians. You're liable to forget <clears throat> exactly where we're up to. So Paul has been writing to the Galatians because there are false teachers in the region of Galatia, and they are teaching, they are teaching the Galatians that having received Christ by faith, that's not simply enough. They need to obey uh, Torah law in order to achieve the fullness of salvation or something to that effect. And he, he counters the idea that they also need to become ethnically Jewish. They need to get circumcised and practice Torah, Sabbath keeping, and practice all of the laws in order to be faithful to God. And Paul is writing to counter that. He is writing to correct this false teaching that is taking root in uh, Galatia. He's, he's, he's looking to counter it. And so where we were at last time is he, uh, he after giving his testimony about how he received uh, the gospel from the Lord Jesus Christ himself, he begins to appeal to their own experience. <clears throat> their own experience, you know. He says, look, has your experience been that you received the Spirit of God through works of the law. Well, of course, their experience was, well, no, this, this works of the law business was something that came from these Judaizers afterwards. He says, so, so if you didn't receive the Spirit by works of the law, then it, your salvation must not be coming from works of the law. This must be something else. Paul, Paul is now going to add another thread to his argumentation here. Not only has it not been their experience that the Spirit of life comes from works of the law, but he's now going to add some legal argumentation to it as well. You see, because no doubt the Judaizers who have come from Jerusalem and, and are, have been preaching and teaching against Paul's gospel, no doubt they have been quoting the scripture, they've been quoting the Torah to the Galatians, saying, don't you know it says this? And don't you know it says that? Paul is now going to bring some quotes of his own. He's now going to bring uh, some challenges of his own from the law. Now, I... Maybe you're not like me, but my imagination sometimes runs wild with um, scenarios. I like to imagine Paul presenting this argument like he's a lawyer in a courtroom. Like he's a lawyer in a courtroom. And he's, and he's, he's coming here, um, and he says this. He says, his premise is this. His argument before the judge is this. Uh, he says, all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. All who rely on works of the law are under the curse. And in order to bolster his argument before the judge, he offers Exhibit A. He says, Exhibit A, here's, here's the first exhibit I want to, I want to give to you um, here this, this, uh, in this letter. Here, Deuteronomy 27, 6. Doesn't the law say everyone who does not do everything written in the law is cursed? So premise one, that the law teaches that everyone who does not do everything written in the law is cursed. Paul then moves on to his next argument. Exhibit B, Habakkuk 2.4, the righteous live by faith. Now, at this point, I like to imagine Paul has got a southern drawl, and he's uh, perhaps in a, a white creamy suit parading before the judge, and he's saying, look, Your Honor, let me just present to you this from the law. Does the law not state it from itself that the righteous will, not, the righteous will live by faith? Your Honor, doesn't it seem to suggest that even the law itself points to something outside of itself for justification. And your honor, if it, if it behooves the court, I will, I will give you exhibit C. Let us go to Leviticus 18.5. The one who does these things will live by them. The law says that if you do these things, you will live. Well, your honor, there is just one problem. There is just one problem with that. No one does all of these things. There is no one righteous. No, not one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Scene. <laughs> it's in this three-step sequence. Paul quotes the law. <clears throat> and he makes this argument. He's like, look, <clears throat> if you want to live by these things, understand you are bound by this code. You are bound by this law and all the things that are in the law. In fact, Paul in Romans, in the book of Romans, when he's dealing with this issue in the Roman church, he will say, look, don't you know that everything that the law writes to those who are outside the law, he writes to those who are inside the law, when it says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No one is righteous. No, not one. No one seeks after God. Paul, 
is, is counteracting these false teachers and saying, look, if you are trying, if you're trying to get these Galatians to submit to this teaching, to this law, they need to know and understand the full weight and burden which they are placing upon themselves. You see, if the Galatians are wanting to be justified before God by this system, then Paul seems to think that they have not really thought this through. Any religious system that is not based in faith, and specifically faith of Jesus Christ, will bring with it a form of slavery. To help bring out the essence of this, I hope, you know, to try and make this clear. You know, it's, it's difficult when we are Christians and have been in the church for long enough because we learn this Christianese, right? So we learn that Jesus is the right answer. Yes? Yeah, okay. This is mostly. Thank you. Jesus is the right answer except when he's insufficient and we just go ahead and do things on our own strength, right? <clears throat> we, we, all, we all hear Christian sayings, you know, Jesus is is, you know, he's freed us and Jesus is, you know, saves us and, you know, we're free from the law and what exactly does that mean or why is that important or, you know, what is that, like, do I just get to do whatever I want now or here, I, I want to try and make it clear the difference, what is, what is the difference between faith and law? What is the difference between law and faith? Because law brings a curse, whether it's Torah law or any other law that you're living under. What is the difference between law and faith? And I've got a couple of analogies here because giving simple definitions sometimes doesn't do justice to the heart of what I think the difference is, right? <clears throat> and so let's firstly, let's remember our definition, our working definition of faith, which is believing loyalty, right? It's I believe in Jesus and what he has done, and so I am loyal to him and his kingdom. Does that make sense? is that loyalty to Jesus will naturally affect how I live. So it's not just some kind of mental ascent. Yes, I believe in the resurrection. I believe that it really happened. Therefore, bingo, bango, I'm in. No, it is a loyalty. It is a heart posture of loyalty or keeping faith with Jesus and for his kingdom and his ways and allowing that to change us and to transform us. So, so that's, that's our working definition of faithfulness. Now, why is this, why is faith opposed to law? <clears throat> I'll, I'll give you an illustration. Imagine you have a dog, right? Now, dogs by nature are loyal creatures. What if we expected perfection from dogs, otherwise we put them to death? Dogs by... <laughs> Dogs, because of the weakness of their nature, sometimes they're going to poop on a carpet. Sometimes they're going to run through a screen door. Sometimes they're going to chew up your beloved pair of shoes. But despite all of their failings, they are loyal to their masters. And a good dog owner will be patient in helping to train the dog to act in the way that is right. The master loves his dog, cares for his dog, feeds his dog, spends time with his dog. Not based on the dog's ability to perform but simply because they love the dog. Now, you're not a dog. And that, that, like I said, I, I, don't, I don't want you to walk away from here going, yeah. Like, this is, a, this is helpful for me to understand my relationship with the Lord, you know. <clears throat> um, it's, it's, it's an analogy. An analogy gives you part of the picture. And Paul will use, the scriptures use analogies all the time to help convey meaning where just clear-cut words don't always speak the truth, Right? I'll give you another. I'll give you another analogy. The difference between uh, the difference between law and and faith um, comes from marriage. Imagine a marriage. Some of you are in them now. Imagine a marriage relationship where the vows. Uh, uh, now, in a marriage relationship, the, you make vows to each other when you begin the marriage. But whose marriage vows were explicit enough to cover every aspect of married life? I promise to do the dishes three nights a week. I promise the rubbish will not sit for, a full, for more than a full 12 hours before taking it out. I promise not to snore. If I snore, you may nudge me in the middle of the night. If the snoring persists, you may escalate to a closed fist until I wake and change positions. Now, this is jokes, right? This is jokes, but... But it highlights the nature 
of the relationship that happens in a marriage relationship. You see, you see, no one goes into a marriage relationship with a clearly defined contract about what each person's roles and responsibilities will be at every single moment of every single day with a list of punishments and, and consequences for failing to meet that contractual ob- obligation. In fact, I imagine if your marriage did start out like that, your marriage would very quickly begin to feel a lot like slavery. Where you're not picking up your dirty laundry off the floor because you love your spouse and you know that it bothers her and you want her to feel loved by this act of service. No, you do it because you fear the repercussions of violating the contract that you signed at the beginning. Does this begin to highlight to you the difference between the law and faithful loyalty. I'm loyal to my wife, that's why I pick up my dirty laundry most of the time. (laughs) And she is gracious to me when I forget. (laughs) Most of the time. (laughs) Look. Uh, look, I was saying, I was using dirty laundry as an, as an example. I wasn't asking to air anybody's dirty laundry here uh, this morning. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, you see, this is, this, is, this is what the law was. This is, this is how the law came about. If you read the narrative story of how they come to Mount Sinai and God proposes, proposes to Israel, I, I'll be your God and you will be my people. They're, they're entering into a covenant not too dissimilar from that of marriage. And, and that initial covenant, that initial covenant had the Ten Commandments, right? And the story gives us that, gives us that, that Ten Commandments, and then shows us how immediately, before Moses is even down the mountain, they are breaking those commandments. They are showing themselves to be unfaithful to the God who they just made this covenant with. And this happens time and time and time again. And so it's almost like, it's almost like the, 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 the writers of Scripture, they have to get more and more explicit. No, 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 okay. All right, look, we started with 10, but here, let me, let me be more explicit about what faithfulness to me looks like in your context. Here's what faithfulness to Yahweh looks like in the ancient Near Eastern context. I don't want you going after the Egyptian gods. I don't want you going after the Assyrian gods. I don't want you going after them. Here's what faithfulness to me looks like. It looks like this. And a law code gets built up. And a whole system of thought gets built up. And so the heart, if the heart's not in it, it just becomes a set of rules. And if it just is a set of rules, then what it becomes is slavery. Is why God would say, Israel, they will acknowledge me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Because you see, the law never had the ability to change people's hearts. The law never had the ability to give life. It is only the Spirit of God that can give life. And when you're living in relationship. That relationship ebbs and flows, and there, there's a dynamic at play. I remember hearing this person speak about marriage one time, and, and they were talking about how, <clears throat> you know, so many people say that in a marriage relationship, it's got to be 50-50. It's got to be 50-50, right? Which instinctually you feel like, well, yeah, of course, it needs to be fair, right? You do half, I do half, like, isn't that fair? And what this person said is like, no, no, marriage is 100%. It means that we, as a unit, need to find 100%, right? If I come in from work one day, right, and I've had a horrible day at work, I'm at 20%. They, they, were, saying, they were using this example. I come home from work, and I say to my wife, look, I'm, I'm at 20%. And she might say, that's okay. I'll cover you. I've got the rest. I've got the 80%. We'll, we'll get to 100 Right? There's other days when, when, when I'll come home and, and I'll be like, look, I'm at 30%. She'll say, look, I'm at 25 And we need to say, okay, let's just pause for a moment before we do anything else just to make sure we don't hurt each other. Right? In that kind of dynamic where it's about maintaining the relationship, where it's about maintaining the covenant, where it's about maintaining that union, the rules go out the window. 
The rules go out the window. It becomes about maintaining that relationship. And this is what God demonstrates about his faithfulness all throughout Israel's story, is they demonstrate that they are unfaithful, and he again and again and again restores the relationship, restores the relationship, restores the relationship. But the law was never, never able to change hearts. It was only the Spirit of God, only the Spirit of God that can change hearts. Now, Jesus, Paul, brings up for the Galatians, he says this. He says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us because it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung upon a tree. Jesus came to redeem us from the curse. Redeem us from this slavery. The word being translated here as redeemed was often used in the Greco-Roman world regarding the purchase of a slave or a captive. To buy them for oneself or to purchase them or to ransom them as a captive for the purpose of freedom. Paul is saying, Jesus, Jesus, this is what he has done for you on the cross. He became cursed on our behalf so that we might be released from the curse of the law. That underneath the Levitical system... Jesus became the once and for all atoning sacrifice on behalf of his people so that they might be free from living under that curse. To which we say amen, yes? Amen. Amen. But the astute amongst you might be also asking this question. But Patrick, we aren't Jewish. And neither were the Galatians. So what does this have to do with us? Do you think the Galatians had it much better living under paganism? Forever fearing that they hadn't done enough to please the gods and find favor with them. Continuing to have to offer sacrifices and offerings in order to ensure that their crops wouldn't fail. Or that they wouldn't die in childbirth or some other disaster would not fall upon them. Being enslaved to a religious system that said you must do this otherwise calamity will befall you. To do it and living under that fear, living under that pressure like a whip constantly on the back. Do you think the Galatians had it any better? Look at the church in Ephesus. Right in the book of Acts, you know, we have this instance where, um, where uh, the, the, the believers, it seems, um, are convicted by the Holy Spirit. I think, I think it was after uh, the, the incident with the seven sons of Sceva where where the name of Jesus was employed by those who weren't faithful followers of Jesus, and it ended up turning on them. They ended up getting beat up, and it caused a fear of the Lord to actually spread throughout the region. And it seems that the believers, for some reason, then brought out all their scrolls of magic and sorcery and burned them. Now, why, why were... Now, this may seem weird for you, but why were Christians harboring witchcraft in their midst? If it wasn't for them being maybe just a touch afraid and keeping that in their back pocket just in case Jesus wasn't enough. The ancient world lived under this fear. They lived under this fear. The beautiful thing about Jesus, his sacrifice, is you don't have to be Jewish to benefit from it. Just like he says to Israel, come out from your slavery to Egypt. He looks at the slavery in your life and says, you can come too. You can come to. You see, the curse of the law is not something that is exclusive to that was exclusive to the Jewish people. Yes, they had the Torah of Moses, they had the teaching of Moses. It's something that we all find ourselves under. Some of you grew up in strict religious households where your acceptance by mom and dad was more about keeping to a strict behavioral code rather than simply being loved and embraced, despite all your failings. Some of you have come out of New Age movement with all of its entanglements and enslavements to spirits who will use knowledge and power from the spiritual realm to coerce and enslave you to themselves. Some of you are just living under a general pull of guilt and fear and anxiety, and I'm so glad we prayed for that this morning. Some of you are living under the fear that maybe you're not a good enough mom or dad. Maybe you're not living up to your potential. Some of you are are living under the fear that maybe you're never going to be able to stop that one particular sin. 
that maybe God can't forgive you for that horrible thing you did all those years ago. Maybe, you're, maybe the world is going to end unless I do, I do, I do, I do. And you're living under the whip of performance-based acceptance. And Jesus came to break that curse over your life and to redeem you from the slavery from it. <clears throat> so for Paul, he's desperate to make sure that the Galatians, having tasted this freedom, having experienced it firsthand, having received the spirit of life by coming to Jesus simply by faith, not through the avenue of circumcision or works of the law, but simply receiving it by faith, receiving the spirit of life, receiving the renewal of, of the inner man. Paul wants to make sure that having tasted this freedom in Christ, they don't inadvertently sell themselves back into slavery to another law-based, rules-based, fear-based system of acceptance before God because it was never going to work in the first place. And Paul wants to make that abundantly clear. He wants to make that abundantly clear. And I just want to follow Paul's thought through um, here, starting at verses, verse 15, um, because I, I want us to just touch on verses 15 to 18, because I think they're important, uh, before we actually be, get more pa maybe pastoral. I mean, actually, how do, we, how do we experience this freedom from, from the effects of the curse in our own lives? But... Paul says this, he says, brothers and sisters, I'm using a human illustration. No one sets aside or makes additions to a validated human will. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. It does not say, and to seeds, as though referring to many, but referring to one, and to your seed, who is Christ. My point is this, the law, which came 430 years later, does not invalidate a covenant previously established by God and thus cancel the promise. The reason why I want us to just touch on this this morning is because no doubt when Paul is writing this, there are some unvoiced objections to what Paul has just said. Some unvoiced objections, some unvoiced arguments that might be hanging in the air. Well, of course, Paul, it says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Yeah, but the story goes on, Paul. Then comes Moses and the law of Moses Paul, you're not living in the fullness of the revelation here, Paul. you got to understand, Paul, it's not just about Abraham. It's about Moses, too. It's about the requirements of the law, Paul. You're not doing it right, Paul. You don't know enough, Paul. And what Paul wants to highlight here, <clears throat> and he wants to draw a distinction in people's minds, is there a di there's a difference between the law of Moses and what was promised to Abraham. That there's a difference. <clears throat> and that in the way in which they are using the law, they are using it in such a way as to invalidate what was promised to Abraham. And Paul wants to make it very clear. No, God never invalidated his promise to Abraham. It wasn't something that was begun by faith, is now being fulfilled and completed by works of the law. No, this whatever came next, this 430-year gap between the promise to Abraham and the law of Moses, the promise was never invalidated by the law. Now, some of you may be then asking yourselves a question, well, what was the point of the law then? Why, why even give the law if it was all about the promise to begin with? And that is a phenomenal question that we will deal with next week. Because Paul's going to get there. Paul's going to get there. Because he, he says in verse 19, why then was the law given? Right? He's going to get there, and we're going to get there, and we're going to talk about why the law was given. But Paul wants the Galatians to know that this is not... That the law was not some evolution of the promise to Abraham that then evolved into something of a works-based righteousness. But the promise to Abraham was something else entirely and something that could never be invalidated by the coming of the law. This promise to receive this blessing for all nations was never going to come. It was never going to come through works of the law. It was only going to come by his seed, the inheritor of that promise, the one Jesus Christ. 
So let's ask ourselves a question here at the end. How do I get free from the effects of the curse? You see, because it's all well and good for us to say, well, you just come to Jesus by faith and, and um, all will be well. But the lived experience of many Christians is that that's, that just doesn't feel like that's the case. I mean, we literally just prayed for a bunch of Christians this morning who are struggling with anxiety. Now, there should be no shame on you for that. Right? They're like, we're not here to put people down in any way because of that. But let's just be honest about the lived reality of so many Christians' experiences is that it's difficult. It's difficult having lived in a slave mindset for your whole life to come out of that and to live as a free son or daughter of God. So how do I, how do I get free from the effects of the curse? The curse has been broken over your life when you come to Jesus, and it's important that we engage in the renewal of our mind, the renewal of our hearts, so that we can actually live in the freedom that Christ has actually purchased for us at the cross. And so the simple answer really is Jesus. If you come up with any other method that doesn't have Jesus at the center, then you're just going to replace one form of slavery for another. Okay? You're just going to replace one form of slavery for another. So let me just shortcut that whole process for you. Maybe a lifelong learning. Um, don't do that. Go straight to Jesus, right? And in relationship with him and his Holy Spirit, you guys can work it out. And he will free you because he loves you and he desires for you to be free. But let me get more practical. That, that's probably not helpful for a lot of you. Okay, yes, Jesus. Yeah, we got it. We, we got it. We could have gone down to Sunday school and got that, you know? <clears throat> Let me try to be more practical. It begins with honesty and humility. It begins with honesty and humility. First John 1, First John says this, If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now he's writing that to Christians. If we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. Sometimes, sometimes there, there's a strain of of <clears throat> there's a strain of, of self-help, uh, compassion even, uh, therapy, counseling, whatever you kind of want to call it, that's like, no, 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 you're enough, you're fine, everything's fine, everything's good, right? And, and in one sense, that's true, like as in, you're loved and accepted by God's grace, not based on any, like you're not performing to a level, then God will accept you. So in one sense, that's true. But sometimes what people do with that is they can't then acknowledge their own failings and their own sins and their own faults, right? And so in order for us to actually be free from the curse, we have to acknowledge that, hey, that, uh, yeah, I, you know what? I do fall short. I, I, I have failed. I have sinned. I've hurt people. I've done bad things. I've been unfaithful to God. <clears throat> it begins with that humility. It, denying the truth of our shortcomings doesn't help at all. Maybe, maybe you were a terrible mom or a terrible dad. Maybe you did really some really bad stuff and glossing over your sin is not going to help. But here is why Jesus is good news. It's not good news because now we're accepted by God. We can just ignore all our stuff and we're just accepted and loved anyways. You are accepted and loved anyways, right? But he doesn't want you to just live in that state of denial. He wants you to walk in genuine freedom. Does that distinction make sense? The verse goes on in 1 John 1 and says, says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, Jesus is able to not only forgive us, amen, he forgives us. If you're struggling under the burden of sin this morning, I want you to know that his forgiveness is free. If you, if you feel this barrier between you and God because of something that you've done, there's some burden, there's some sin, there's something that's weighing on you this morning that's in the back of your mind that I can't come to God, I need to keep this from him, I need to hide it from him, I want you to be free this morning and release it to him. He already knows. Realize his forgiveness is free for you. His grace is free for you. But what the beautiful thing 
is not only does Jesus forgive us and invite us back into right relationship with himself and reconciles us to the Father, not only do we receive that, but it says this. He says, he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. He cleanses us from it. Not only are we received back into right relationship, freely and by His grace, but He takes us and He begins to clean us up. He begins to bandage up, bandage up our hurts and our wounds. And He begins just to heal us from the effects of sin. And so coming to Jesus in faith and trusting Him to do that for us is how the curse is broken in our lives. The effects of the curse is broken in our lives. So when the law of Moses comes to you, and says, you stand condemned because you have not kept all 613 commands of the Torah. You can say, yeah. Yeah, you're right. You're right. But Jesus told me I don't have to live under that system anymore. He says I'm free to go with him. When the pagan gods demand that their sacrifices in order to be appeased, otherwise you will come under their wrath. You can say, Jesus told me I don't have to do that anymore. I'm loved by God, not based on any sacrifice that I made, but based on a sacrifice that he made, his unconditional love for me. And he says that I'm free to go with him. And when society tells you that you're not good enough, when society rejects you because of your failings, when you experience social stigma because you're not living up to maybe their standards or even self-imposed standards of what you think you should be, you can say, you know what, you're probably right on so many things and probably a whole host of sins you don't even know about. But Jesus says, I can go with him. So I'm just going to go with him. When religious people attack, sounds like a, a documentary from the Nature Channel, National Geographic. When religious people attack, sometimes religious people are the most vicious Sometimes you find more grace in the world than you ever do in the church. But when religious people attack and say, your, whatever you're doing, your style of worship is not good enough. Or maybe they'll come to you and say, your theology, your theology isn't perfect. Sometimes we can respond by going, okay, I'll worship better. Or sometimes we'll respond, oh, okay, I guess I'll go study more and I'll learn more and I'll figure it all out and... Or you can simply say, yeah, probably. I, I don't worship God the way that I should. And thank God my theology is not enough to get me in heaven. But Jesus says I can go with him. Despite all of my imperfect theology. And despite how I fail in worship all the time. And on that great day when the accuser stands against you on that day of judgment, Jesus will stand in the courtroom in heaven and say, I'm with him, and he's free to go. He is good. He is so kind and so gracious. And you do not need to live under the slavery to Torah law. You don't need to live under the slavery of societal expectations upon you. You don't need to live under the expectations that religious communities might put on you. All you need is Jesus. And he says, you can come with me. So I'd love for you to stand. I'd love for the worship team to come back.